oh, we want you to come with us tonight, those who live here and those who are online as we prepare to go into our Bible study. As we said, we continue to talk about being positioned to seek, to serve, and to seek. And God continues to share with us everything that we need so we can have better vision, a better hearing, better understanding of everything that he has for us to do. Amen. And so, for our lesson tonight, uh, I know everybody knows it's been hot. It's still hot. <laughs> and the heat is lingering. And the heat is here for a while to stay. Amen. But God consistently reminds us uh, and helps to remind us that there is a place uh, that is worse than this. That is hotter than this. And as I always think about it, my think about my uncles and the deacons would pray this prayer and always say hell is too hot and eternity is too long and so that is just a reminder for each and every one of us to know and to grasp that God has set forth a place for us so that we can rest as the old people said and thank you Holy Ghost in the coolness of the day and that's what we're going to talk about for our lesson today uh, we're going to share that topic that talks about this uh, be positioned to reside and walk in the cool. Amen. Be positioned to reside and walk in the cool. And when you think about this, there's one thing you will hear people say with this certain church song they were saying. They say, I'm going to walk around heaven all day. But I've been in this world for a while, and I know there's been others that have been in this world longer than me. I think I got some witnesses where I've never heard anybody sing a song. Well, I'm going to stroll around heaven all, around hell all day. I've never heard anybody sing that song or make that statement. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to walk around hell all day and just go enjoy myself as I take a stroll around hell. I don't hear anybody make mention of that. I don't hear anybody say they want to do that because understand, hell is not the place where you want to be. Amen. And so once again, we're talking about be positioned to reside and walk in the cool. And so we're going to have two scriptures we're going to share as our foundation. Uh, as we said, Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture. And understand, God always sets forth everything to help us understand. And so our Old Testament scripture is going to be coming from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. After we leave Genesis, we can tag Luke chapter 16 and verses 22 through 25. But we're going to begin at the book of beginnings. And book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. So get your Bibles, get your pen, get your pencil. Use your tablet or your phone, whatever you need to take your notes, your pad, and do all those things. Go ahead and grab it as we prepare to go into the word of the Lord. Amen. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 is our initial scripture from the Old Testament. And this is what the word of God says. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. We'll read that again. It is in the book of beginnings, so it lets us know where man started out. Man started out in the cool of the garden. Amen? That's where he started out. And so we just want to make sure we get an understanding of where we began and where God is taking us and where God will bring us. Amen? It says this, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And so if you will now turn with us to the book of Luke, chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Verses 22 to 25. We've heard this scripture before. Uh, we shared this scripture with you before. Amen. 
Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 25. And it's a familiar scripture, but God gives us to us. Amen. Luke chapter 16, and verses 22 through 25. Luke chapter 16 and verses 22 through 25. That's our New Testament scripture. And this is how it reads. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his book. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue. Understand what he says, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Amen? Amen. So understand, we have a choice. God has given us a choice. We started out in the cool, and we're going to walk through this and understand that man messed that up. God didn't do it. Man did. And, and we have to understand this, children, before we proceed a little bit further. Everything in the Word is true, is authenticated, and comes to pass because it's God's Word. It's God's will. And the way God set everything up, everything that man does will activate something in God's Word, whether it be good, or whether it be bad. And so we have this tendency, and I'm talking about mankind, people, we, human beings, we have this tendency of saying things and doing things and then trying to point at someone else. And this is what happened at Adam and Eve once they disobeyed God, pointing at someone else and making excuses for what we have done. And that's, that's how God understood and knew that man had did what he told him not to do. Because in that moment where they ate of the fruit, in that moment, notice, that closeness that they had with God, it went away. The relationship that they had with God, it went away. And understand, in dealing with everything that he did, that God had already said, God said, if you eat from the tree, you shall die. So understand God did not activate that. His word was already in place. Man activated it. And so everything that we see going on in this world today, good, bad, ugly, better, whatever, is activated by either a word or an action from man. And, and we look at it from this standpoint, and like we see, we always wonder, God had me go into physics, but you look at this thing and understand one of, this, one of the theories that, that Einstein had was the theory of relativity. He said, everything is relative to everything else, which means everything impacts everything else. Everything that goes on in this universe has an impact on everyone in this universe. Man impacts everything because that's the way it's structured. Now, we look at this, we talk about cool. We look at it from various viewpoints. If we look at it from society's definition, this is what society says cool is. It says cool it generally means and defined as being calm. It means casual. It means fashionable. It means hip. It means trendy. It means that you are with it, that you are part of it, that you are active in it, that you participate in it. That's what it means. And you're doing it in such a way that you are being accepted. And we talked about this Sunday. Accepted by those and the people in the crowd who, who already generate, who already clarify, and already, who already say and confirm and state and indicate that they are cool people. Now, from the scripture's definition, 
The Hebrew definition of cool means this. And we hear what cool means in the Old Testament Hebrew. This is what cool means. It means air. It means breath. It means to breathe. It means to perceive. It means to smell. It means to anticipate. It means to enjoy. It means to touch. It points to courage. Remember what God told Joshua? Hmm? Be strong or of good courage. So in essence, he was telling Joshua, be cool. It means spirit. It pertains to whirlwind. And that's key because remember what Jesus said about the spirit? Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, the spirit is like a wind, it's as a whirlwind. And often whenever something went on in the Old Testament that God was dealing with it, it said it came as a whirlwind. It also means this, sensible exaltation. Another phrase for sensible exaltation is this. And this takes us back to an old movie that was made some years ago, Whitney Houston and all these. This is what sensible exhalation means. It means waiting to exhale. And you see how popular that movie was? And in every instance, those women were doing something to try to find themselves, to get themselves out of basically what they had or hot messes to try to find a cool and peaceful place to be. Now, in the Greek meaning of it, this is what cool means. It means to cool down or to cool off. It also means to refresh. And right now, generally, what we are, what a lot of people are in during the summer season, when you grew up, this is what we would see, especially in the summertime, people would have revivals. Revivals are geared toward refreshment. That's what they're geared toward. And so you see how all this is, is tied together when we're talking about God and dealing with God. Now, you have to look at cool from two standpoints. You have the artificial cool, and you have the actual cool. Artificial cool and the actual cool. Now, when we talk about the artificial cool, that means it's a fake cool, it's an imitation cool, it's a man-made cool, it's a pretend cool cool. That's something that a lot of the young men, most of them were coming up, we had fake cools and imitation cool. Now we were trying to either talk to a young lady or be around our friends. We would generate a form of coolness to try to generate, to make it seem as though we were like that or we were that person. Artificial cool is this. Artificial cool is set up by Satan and it's carried out by his cliques. And that's why we have to be very particular when we talk about click this and club that because generally clicks are associated with Satan, not with God. God has his kinsmen, he has his people. When you start talking about clicks and all of these type of things where people are coming together because certain uh, sex or certain people or certain statuses, those things are things that are set up. And they do that in order for them to be deemed as acceptable and cool in their surrounding area and as the people that they surrounded with. Artificial cool means this. It's founded upon brands. And we're talking about name brands. In other words, you have to wear something made by somebody else with somebody else's name on it for you to make it seem like you're cool. So your name doesn't allow you to be cool. You don't have a name that you can say that you're cool all by yourself. God said we were made in his image. God said we are precious. God said we are his chosen generation. But yet we'll go out and try to find somebody we don't even know, a name that we don't even know, and we'll gravitate to that, and we'll purchase that, we'll do all kind of things to get that other person's name to place somebody else's name on us. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When the one name we should desire to be associated with, the one name we should have on us, in us, around us, all of the time is Jesus. Uh, they want Gloria Vanderbilt, you got Gucci bags, you got even Air Jordan. We'll put somebody else's name on us to try to allow ourselves to feel better about ourselves. You're talking about things when you're talking about games and, and trends. All these things are artificial cool. Talk about artificial cool. Talk about this. It's something that's called, and we used to say this, hot fun. But the place that always talks about hot fun 
always concludes with you being in hell fire or leaves you living or, or, or spending eternity in a hot fire. Now, actual cool means this. Actual cool means authentic, it means definite, it means genuine, it means real. Actual cool is granted by God and confirmed in Jesus Christ. Actual cool is founded upon blessing, upon grace, and upon truth. Actual cool, or sometimes people will call it Christian height, but it concludes with Christ in heaven. Now, now look at this, and this is the thing, thank you, Holy Ghost. When you look at Jesus, in the midst of everything that the, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the people were trying to do, everything they were doing was to try to impress the people. In other words, they were trying to be cool before the crowd. And so Jesus came in just simple, genuine, and real. And we remember when the, the chief priests had sent some of the, their soldiers and some of the people to go and follow Jesus, and the Pharisees were following Jesus, and the Sadducees were following Jesus, and they sent their troops to go and arrest Jesus. And when the troops went to arrest Jesus, Jesus was preaching. He was teaching. And instead of going to arrest him, they aligned with him and they acknowledged him. When they came back, they came back, but they did not have Jesus. And they said, where is Jesus? And this is what those, those men said. They said, never have we heard a man speak the way that man speaks. So he's not just speaking words of if he, he are reading them, he, he's reading those words. He's speaking those words with authority. He's speaking those words as if those words are him. And remember, that's what John said, that he is the word. And so that's genuine, that's real. And so people can tell genuineness and realness when you're trying to be somebody you're not. They can tell. And that's why a lot of times we say, well, we want to try to go out into the world and teach the world and evangelize the people in the world. But if we are going to them in a real way, they can tell you. And the thing about that, they will come up and they will strictly say, you just trying to fool me. You just trying to play games with me. And they'll tell you, I've been on the street, I see game all the time. And this is what they'll tell you. This is a, a phrase they'll use. Game knows game. But when you're real with somebody, they'll acknowledge the fact that you definitely are a child of God. You are definitely a disciple of Christ. They'll, 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 they'll say it. They'll admit it. And have no problem doing it at all. And, and that just brings you to this point. Then we're going to move on. The chief priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, and all that they were trying to do, never acknowledged who Jesus was. They just they didn't do it. Those who acknowledged Jesus were not truly of the Jewish sect. There were a few of them who did. Nicodemus came and said it. Gamaliel said it. Joseph of Arimathea said it. But generally, the people who acknowledged the realness and authenticity, authenticated who Jesus was, when Jesus came and the demons saw him coming, Christ, Son of God, why are you coming to torment us before our time? Roman soldiers, surely this man was the Son of God. Centurion came to Jesus to heal his servant. You are a man of authority. And if you speak, it will be done. All these people came to him and acknowledged him as being real and authentic. But those, as he said, those who were his own, who came unto his own, they did not want to acknowledge who he was. Now, when we look at this, mankind shifted his position. And we talked about this. Mankind shifted his position. God did not move from him. He moved from God. Understand that God is in the place he's always been, always has been, always will be. God has not moved. It's man who has moved. And so when you look at this, understand, after the beguilement in the garden, mankind shifted himself. And he shifted himself from seeking to haven with God. And he sought to hide from God. Notice, all before then, they had a, a rendezvous, rendezvous point where they met every day. God knew there was a problem. God showed up. Man didn't. 
And, and so that's the thing. And it got to the point, God knows when we are moved and shifted from him. And notice, in doing so, they were shifting away from the cool that God was offering to them. So in shifting from the cool, they hid themselves and in essence, moved toward cruelty, which meant they were going to move toward pain, suffering, and all of those things that were set forth that God had told them that would come upon them if they disobeyed him. Now, even in these present days, mankind still has a tendency to hide from the blessings of heaven and hover toward the brutality of hell. He just does. And what we're talking about, that means he'll disappear and keep back from the blessings of God but he'll be drawn toward, like a fly, toward goods that won't do him any good. Understand that God has all things. God can supply all of our needs. Man has no supply without him. And so we look at this, we see how man shifted. He hides from God and hovers toward good. Hides from Jesus and hovers toward junk. Hide from the Holy Spirit and hovers toward hype and sin. Think about it. Uh, think about this. I've had friends, I've had relatives, and had a relative, and, and he died. And, and we, a lot of, I was a minister at the time. His brother was ministers. We loaded all, all the family were ministers, a lot of ministers in the family. And the brother had to do his eulogy. And he said this to the family, he said this to everyone who was at the service. He said, this was my oldest brother. Loved him with all my heart. No, he loved me with all his heart. He said, but this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Because I'm praying that he did, but I don't know if he did. Because we would come to him and say, you need to give your life to Christ. You need to come to church. And he said, this is what my brother would say. My brother would say, I know. I know what you're telling me is true. I know I need you. I know I need you. I'm coming. I'm coming. And then when you consistently say, I know I need to do this. I know what you're saying is true. I know what you're saying is right. But he never made that step. And then was the thing that, that, that was just so, so pointed in the whole thing about his life. God says, give your heart to him. Before he passed, years before that, he literally had a heart attack. But he did not die from it. His brother said, he said, God is talking to you, my brother. And he said, once again, he said, I know. He said, God is taking care of you. You had a heart attack. You could have died. He said, I know. And he said, thank y'all for praying for me. I know. And then he would always say, he said, but I'm coming. I'm going to come to church. The only time he would come to the church building, which was ironic, he would show up for a funeral, but he wouldn't come up to a worship service. Anytime there was somebody who died that he knew, he would show up to that funeral. And they would tell him, brother, in the same manner, all of us going to die. In the same way you see your friend laying in that coffin, your day going to come. And he would say this, I know. But this is the thing he said, the only thing that I can hope for is that before he left this world, he hoped that he had that thief on the cross, cross experience. And that before he took his last breath, he said, Lord, forgive me. And so that, that's the thing of understanding when you're talking about the cruel and trying to move toward all those things that are so-called cruelness in the world, you're actually moving toward a situation where you're not moving toward cruelness. You're moving toward cruelty. And this is the other thing you're moving toward. You're moving toward criminality. Because the word says this. If you have a love for the world, if you love the world and the things of the world, you seek the things of the world, it says it causes you to be an enemy with God. Enemies with God don't reside in hell. They just don't. Satan is an enemy. That's what God calls him. He's an enemy. Hell is where the enemies reside. Now, there are ramifications of not being positioned in the cool with God. And God gives it to us in the book of Genesis. Before all of these things happen, notice what happened. 
God created everything. Everything he created. It said he came to man. And notice, man still does that today. And he had man to give it a name. He said whatever name man named it is what God designated to be. To this day, whatever Adam named carries that designation and that name and that title today. Even today, what do we do? We give names to our children. Men name their cars. I know women may name their shoes, but people name things. Even when we deal with medication, what do doctors and engineers do? Every medication that we take has a name. Every virus has a name. What COVID is a name. Everything that is in man's purview, he still names it because God gave him that authority. But notice this. There was a ramification for man moving away from the cool of God. Here's what happened. Adam and Eve and Lazarus, their focus became false. That means they couldn't truly see the way things should be. Their common sense, thank you, Holy Ghost, wasn't common anymore. The same God that they had drawn toward, now they were afraid to approach him. Understand, that's why God said, where are you? And Adam said this, he said, I was afraid. And so all of a sudden, he had been with God, but now he was afraid of the very one who created him. And he said, I was trying to hide myself. Here's the ramification of, of positioning yourself away from the cool with God. The focus on God was less, and the focus on good became more. Why? What did Satan do? He told Eve to look at the goodness that was on the tree. He told her to look at the fruit. He said, look at the fruit. Doesn't it look good? As good as it looks, bite it, and you'll discover it tastes. Notice, it tastes good. So notice how he pulled them away from the goodness of God and drew them toward the goodness of something else. Also, they became less focused on being fruitful. That's what God told them. Be fruitful and multiply. Now understand, he wasn't just talking about having children. He was talking about caring for the garden, caring for everything that he had created in the garden, and he had given man authority to care for it and to maintain it so it would continue to be the paradise that he had put them in. They were less focused on being fruitful and became more focused on being flawed. How do we know that? First thing they said, Lord, we naked. God said, who told you you were naked? So they were naked before, before that day. Who told you you were naked? Then they became less focused on blessing and more on belittling and blaming. What do we see going on at Rampant right now? Especially with everything going on in this MAGA environment, everything with these, these, these convictions and all these things that are going on right now. Everything you see going on right now is belittling and blaming. What was the first thing that Adam Eve did? Adam said this, the one that, the same God that brought the woman to him, he said her name is Woman. God knew something was wrong because Adam looked at God and said, the woman you gave me, <laughs> the woman you gave me caused me to disobey. Then the woman looked and said, the serpent caused me to do it. And the Bible said the serpent didn't have nobody to turn to to look to blame. He, he would have, but there was nobody left. And so you see that same thing going on right now in the midst of everything. Whenever you see that belittling and that blaming and those excuses going on, you see man in a place where he's drawn away from the coolness that is in God. And he's drifting toward the cruelty and the criminality. Then you notice this. Whenever you pull away from the cool with God, your mindset and your mental capacity malfunction. That means it starts to act up. It becomes broken. It becomes faulty. Thank you, Holy Ghost. That's why Paul said what he said. 
present your body human sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. But he said there should be a transformation by the renewing of your mind. Notice that what he said. A renewing of your mind. When you walk away from the cool of God, your mind and your mindset becomes false. Understand this thing. What happens is your ability to be able to gravitate more toward God in the manner that you should, instead of gravitating toward him, you run away from him. And that's what happens when you're going away from the cool and the cool that you have in God. Now, there are four C's that we want to talk about tonight. So you can say that four C's to truly being cool. And it's not going to be anything complex. It's going to be simple. It's not going to be hard. And we're going to give it to you. You can write it down and just remember it. Just four C's. And say, What's the, how, what do I do? to be cool with God? How do I become more driven and, and, and drawn to being back in the cool of the day with God? Four C's we're going to give you. First one is this. Be a companion to Jesus. That's one. Be a companion to Jesus. What does that mean? By being a companion, that means you and Jesus become buddies. You and Jesus become colleagues. You and Jesus become friends. Heard it tonight. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The Bible says, in him you have a friend that's closer than a brother. He said this, he said, I will call you servant, but now I'm going to call you friend. Because the servant doesn't know what that, that master's going to do. I'm calling you a friend. Now, that's what Jesus said. I'm calling you my friend. That's what he said. That's the first way to become back and draw close to being cool. Be a companion to Jesus. Second C is this. Be in the company of Jesus. Be in the company of of Jesus. This was basically what our met the message was about Sunday. It's better to be in Christ than in Christ. When you're in Christ, that means you are in his company. That means you are in his circle. You become like the 12 did. You are one of his disciples. You are part of his group. And more importantly, you are in his house. That's why he said, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. That means now you are in the company of Jesus. It also means you are in the presence of Jesus. Third C to truly being cool is this. Be connected to Jesus. Be connected to Jesus. That means this. Be attached to him. Be bonded with him. Be fixed to and with him. And be united with him. In other words, be one with him. That's what he prayed for us to be. He said, be one with me. Lord, Father, I pray that they will be one with me, that we could be one in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, in that oneness, that oneness is going to demonstrate that we are children of God. Fourth C, to truly be in cool. Be in covenant with Jesus. And we had a, a series and we talked about what covenant means and how important it means to be in covenant. We talked about the church covenant. Those aren't just words. They serve a purpose. It's a commitment. It's a marriage vow in a sense, in a, in, in, in a way we're dealing with that. So it's not just something you just say just to say and don't think about it. Because if you break what's going on in the covenant, that means you're breaking the vow. Be in covenant with Jesus. This is what a covenant is. We talked about it. It's an agreement, it's a contract, and it's a promise. And one thing we knew about God, God does not break his promise. 
Jesus did not break his promise. He came down here and said he would come and be lifted up, said he would be hung on a cross, that he would give his life for his, notice what he said, for his friends. And he kept that covenant. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In the same manner that he said that, when you are in covenant with him, when you are in him, when you are a believer, when you are the disciple, he's going to keep that covenant. You know, a lot of times people make sarcastic statements. We say, well, everybody's been saying Jesus is going to come back for thousands of years. Jesus ain't come back yet. Every time one of his children pass on, he comes back to get him. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he didn't come back. He needs to come back for you, which is probably a good thing. Because if he does, when he does come back and you're not in his covenant, not going to be a pleasant situation. Not going to get to reside in the cool with him. Amen? So, what is God's perspective on cool? A lot of times we talk about, well, what does God think about? What is cool with God? We always talk about what's cool with our friends, what's cool with the world, everything else. But what is God's perspective on cool? We'll share a few with you tonight because we can't cover them all because everything is, 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 is laid out in his word. But these are some, some just to remember, to think about. In God's sight, cool is being a blesser and a blessing, not a belittler and a bully. Uh-oh. Being cool in God's sight is being a blesser and a blessing, not a belittler and a bully. Satan belittles. Satan bullies. Satan puts down, calls people all kind of names. Hmm? And anybody associated with him does the same thing. So when you have association with anyone or someone that belittles, bullies, always Puts down on somebody, calling them names, this, that, and the other. Watch yourself. And you saying you're a child of God? God can look at you and say, that ain't cool. Another one. That's cool in God's sight. Being faithful and not famous. Understand that in the world, everybody wants to be famous. Well, everybody wants to have fame. And Jesus could have had it. It was offered to him. In the, in the wilderness, it was offered to him. Satan said, I'll give you all this that you see this world, all of the fame, all of the glory. That's famous. That's being fame, famous. Then when he tried to get him to jump off the church, he was saying, if you jump off this building and you never take down on the ground, you'll be famous. Everybody will follow you. It's not about being famous. It's about being faithful. said faithfulness is what pleases God. That means faithfulness is cool with God. Judas wanted to be famous. Pilate wanted to be famous. Herod wanted to be famous. All those famous folks don't turn out well. Satan wants to be famous, but he's infamous. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Another thing that's cool in God's sight, being gracious and not greedy. Satan wants everything. He wants to take everything. He wants everything to be his. And that sounds just like somebody else. They want everything. They got it. They got the world. They got riches, but they never have enough. And the Bible says that man never is satisfied. Another thing that's cool in God's sight, being helpful and not heinous. That means you're willing to be a servant. Remember you said the greatest in the kingdom is a servant. That means he, that person that's the greatest is a helper. Person that heinous is always trying to take from somebody, steal from somebody, manipulate somebody. That's being heinous. Heinous means you're a con man. Heinous means you're a grifter. That's another word for it. Simple, simple as you can put it. What else is cool in God's sight? Being a lifter and not a liar. Remember what Jesus said? If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. A lifter is someone who is a witness. We, we, we lift, we elevate people. We raise their spirits. We don't 
beat them down. We tell them what they need to hear so they can be saved from a righteous standpoint. But a liar, which is what Jesus says Satan is, well, he'll tell you what you want to hear. But then, when he doesn't do what he told you, and you get upset, he's simply going to tell you. You knew I was a devil when you met me. And I always remember the story my daddy told me about the man with the snake. I know many probably heard this, that they were walking. It was a cold day, and the man looked down, and the snake looked up at him and said, oh, please, mister. Will you just pick me up and put you in your coat, maybe in your coat? I'm so cold. The man said, I don't know, you a snake. He said, but mister, I promise, mister, I'm not going to bite you. I'm just too cold. I'm not going to bite you, mister. I promise, just put me in your coat and let me warm up a little bit, just, just a little while. So the man said, don't you bite me <laughs> when I put you in my coat. He said, mister, I'm not going to bite you. He said, so he's walking down the road, and all of a sudden, he can feel the snake moving in his, in his, in his coat pocket. Opens his jacket, he looks up, now the snake is like this, getting ready to bite him. He said, you're not going to bite me, are you? He said, you know what, I was a snake when you picked me up. So don't, 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 don't allow yourself to fall into those situations. Then, in God's sight, cool is being merciful and not maniacal. That means showing mercy to somebody. God shows us mercy, and he gives us new mercies every morning. Thing. We're not even worthy of it. Like, don't give me, I'm not even good enough to live, not even, even good enough to die. But yet, God continues to show mercy every day. But somebody maniacal always wants something to happen to somebody, always trying to speak bad on somebody, always want to see somebody hurt, always want to see somebody done in, all, everything. But, like in a movie I saw, he says, a strange thing. How a man who won't give mercy sure will act good. And so that's what we have to understand. Being merciful is cool in God's sight. Another thing that's cool in God's sight, and Jesus made mention of it, being a peacemaker and not a plot monger. That means you ain't going around scheming, doing all these things to cause confusion, to cause division, to cause all kind of discord. That is not cool in God's sight. Well, you say the peacemaker shall be called what? Surety of God. And this is cool in God's sight. Being righteous, not ratchet. And that's the thing they got out there right now. The kids always talking about being, being ratchet. And they think being ratchet is cool. Not cool with God. Those type of things they do, God says, an abomination in his sight. They are disgusting in his sight. But the righteous, he says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And another thing, the Lord shared this with me years ago. Being sanctified, not sexy, is cool with God. God ain't worried about how sexy nobody is. And so we try to tell people, who are you dressing to please? Are we dressing to please God? Are we dressing to please man who is fallen and has no real association with God? I just say, be careful. Whatever bait you use, that bait's going to catch whatever loves that bait. But they say you use worms for fish and some other things. I grew up like this. I know they, people don't see this nowadays, but I used to go crawfishing fishing as a young boy. Now we just buy it in the store. But one of the things that the crawfish loved was this. And the thing was like this. Anything where the chicken meat had been gone bad, meat that was rotten, or that type of thing, if you fed it and you put that in the net, they went crazy over it. If you put fresh meat in the net, wouldn't touch it. Put a worm in the net, wouldn't touch it. And so he always said, I said, my dad, I'm gonna put this meat in. He said, nope, you got, to, you got to let that meat set out and get kind of rancid first, because they're not gonna touch that fresh meat. That's the thing. 
Understand, what you use as bait, be careful who you catch. Now, being truthful and not treacherous is cool with God. God doesn't look well upon treachery. And when you talk about that, that means this. Satan is treacherous. Very treacherous. He's always scheming, always plotting. He, 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 he tries to cover himself up from everything. But it's all for the sake of causing someone to sin, causing someone to fall, causing someone to die. But truth pertains to Jesus, pertains to God, pertains to the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he said, who the Son has set free, shall be free indeed. And so in the midst of everything, when he had the conversation with the woman at the well, we're about to conclude, she went into the discussion about the Samaritans worshiping on this mountain and, and, and the Jews worshiping in this place. And Jesus made this statement to her. He said, there's going to come a day where it's not going to be whether you worship on this mountain or upon that mountain. God is going to look for those who are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I do believe this in my heart. But in the midst of everything that was going on in COVID, God used COVID to see who was true. To see who were true Christians. To see who will worship him in spite of the situation. And believe you me, he did so. Because in doing so, he revealed some people that you would have never thought would not do truly he. And so to understand that, they may have been worshiping, thank you Holy Ghost, in a cool building, but they were not in a cool position with God. Amen? And so, as we conclude tonight, this is our, our, our concluding statement. Don't lose your cool. And you know sometimes we'll say that, oh, I'm about to lose my cool, I'm, I'm about to go off. Well, don't go off. <laughs> don't lose your cool. Don't become so wrapped up in being cool with all the man-made groups and the games that you wind up losing your cool with Almighty God. Don't try to say, well, I'm good with the boys. And then God say, depart from me, I never knew. And as the word says, men don't have a heaven and hell, they put you in. But God does. Understand this, what the Bible says in Job 27 and 8. I'm reading out the five Bible verse. He says, for what is the hope of the godless and polluted? Even though he has gained in this world, when God cuts him off and takes away his life. This passage is basically what Jesus referred to when he's talking about how does it profit a man to gain a whole world and lose his soul? That's why we say you can't separate old and new temple. Then, in James chapter 4, verse 4, New Living Translation, we read this, I think last week, or one of the previous lessons. It said, you adulterers, don't you realize, and we made mention of this earlier, that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. You can't serve two masters. can't do it. And so here's what we want to share is revelation on the future to come for the cool, the truly cool. This is what it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Let's start reading at verse 1, read down uh, to probably verse 8. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 to verse 8, this is what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, 
new Jerusalem, that means refreshed, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Hear what it says? The tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Notice he said that twice. And be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former or the old things are passed away. They're gone. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Remember we said new, cool meant refreshed? In essence, I make all things cool again. And he said unto me, Write, for these, hear what he said, these words are true and faithful. What we say, what? Does God perceive as being cool, true, and faithful? And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Who else did he tell that to make that statement to? That woman at the wedding. Then he says this. He that overcometh, who doesn't get drawn away from the cool, shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, and here it is, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and hear this, children, because they talk about everything that's sinful. They talk about everything, but they won't mention this. But they'll say lying is all right. This is what Revelation says. This is what God says about that. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And it says, which is the second death. So this is what you have to understand. Those who are not cool die twice. But like the old saints and patriarchs would say, I done died one time. Ain't gonna die no more. Which meant this. When they received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and when they made that open demonstration of going down into the water and being baptized, they were saying right then, they, they were being buried, their sin was being buried, that old man was being buried, and that new man was coming to be. They went away from being uncool, thank you, Holy Ghost, from being uncool with God to once again being in the cool with God. And so we leave you by saying this, children. Continue to be cool. Now, I know we said this, grew up and said this, but in this context, for our lesson and for what we're sharing with you tonight, people of God, this is what cool stands for. The C-O-O-L. C, first C means child. First O means of, the second O means our, and the L means law. So this is what it means to be cool, to continue to be cool. That means continue to be a child of our law. As long as you're a child of the law, you cool. But when you're not, You're not cool at all, not with God. You may be all right with the world, and then the world's going to be all right with you just for a little while. But when you are a child of the Lord, you are in that place.
but God initiated everything. You're in the cool with him. So as you started out, when man was in the cool with God, man positioned himself away, and God kept the promise. He said, in the same way that man started out in the cool with me, I'm going to bring him back into the cool. And so Jesus brought us back into the cool. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Father God, for all you share. Thank you for all that you show. Thank you for all that you reveal. And Father, thank you for bringing us back into the cool. Thank you for helping us understand, Father God, the necessity of being in the cool with you. Thank you, Father God, for using this summer weather. Thank you for using this heat. Thank you for using the elements that we're in right now to help to push us and to lead us and direct us to having a desire to be in the cool of the day with you and not to reside in the heat of the fire with those who do not know you. And so, Father, we just thank you for all you do. Thank you for helping us to see. Thank you for helping us to understand. And, Father, we just can't say it enough. We love you from the bottom of our hearts. We praise you and we give you the glory. And, Father, we continue to pray for our sick and shut-in. Continue to pray for those who are bereaved. Continue to pray, Father God, yes, for those who may have contracted COVID. Ask, Father God, that you be their healer, that you be their physician, that you be their remedy, that you be the cure that you always are. And Father, we know that you can because you are God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. All right, children, everyone, we thank God for another opportunity. And once again, we're just going to leave you with this. Be cool. And so may the blessings of God that I am that I am be with you as you go through your journey as you go through your walk with him. And once again, we're going to say this when we leave you. Y'all be cool. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Be cool.